Coming up on DTNS, a Swiss court rules that a like or even a share can be defamation. An Indian politician deep fakes himself. And can you really replace your laptop with a tablet? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, February 21st, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Lynn Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We also have with us today host and producer of the In Touch with iOS podcast, Dave Ginsberg. Dave, welcome. Good to have you on the show, man. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. And I'm from Chicago. <laughs> excellent. Way, so. Excellent. Another uh, Illinois yeah, person. Th thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. We're going to talk with Dave in a little bit about uh, that idea of re replacing your laptop uh, or even maybe your PC with a tablet. Uh, we were just talking about possibly sponsoring a pig at a state fair and all kinds of other stuff on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Samsung named former finance minister Bok J. Wan as its board chairman, the first time the position has been filled by a non-executive director. Bok served as outside director at Samsung since March of 2016 and replaces outgoing Lee, Lee Sang-hoon, who was jailed in December for interfering with union activities. Sony and Facebook both announced they will not attend the Game Developers Conference next month in San Francisco, citing concerns over the coronavirus. Facebook still plans to make the announcements it had planned for GDC through video online question and answers, and more. Which is odd, because Facebook's just a ride down the 101 from San Francisco, so it wouldn't have been far, but they just don't want to gather. After being banned in Colombia on February 1st, Uber is legally operating again in the country. After a court sided with a taxi company that sued Uber and ruled that Uber had violated competition rules, the company changed its model to allow riders to rent a vehicle along with a driver and will technically act as a point of contact between the two parties in Colombia. Let's not mince words. Libra has looked like it's falling apart as a possible uh, cryptocurrency, but... It broke the string of bad luck. Shopify announced it will join the Libra Association and invest at least $10 million in Libra's reserve, operate a node on its network, all the things you have to do to become a member of the Libra Association. Uh, that puts them uh, different in a different position than Vodafone, Visa, MasterCard, Stripe, PayPal, Mercado Pago, Bookings Holdings, and eBay, all of whom have withdrawn from the Libra Association in the last six months or so. Libra Association now stands at 21 members, if you're counting. Let's talk a little more about uh, Facebook wanting to give you some money. Yeah, not a lot of money, turns out. To improve voice recognition, Facebook announced a new program in its Viewpoints Market Research app called Pronunciations that will pay users to make voice recordings. Users will record the phrase, Hey Portal, followed by a first name from their friends list. Recording a list of 10 friends with each phrase spoken twice will earn the user 200 points in the Viewpoints app, which could be cashed out when you get to 1,000 points for $5. And that's through PayPal, five U.S. dollars. Oh. Yep. Recordings will not be associated with a Facebook profile, so says the company, and won't be shared without permission. Pronunciations is available to U.S. users older than 18 with more than 75 Facebook friends. It's funny. I, I, I floated this uh, almost in jest by a, a couple of my friends who are not huge fans of Facebook, and they were like, great, you get $5 in Facebook will be deep faking you for the rest of your life. And I was like, okay, well, that's a little silly. But but uh, this does seem like, okay, it is good to uh, kind of pull the crowd and see how um, speech recognition could be better and what better than your own community. But at the same time, it's a little insulting, the, the money situation, to, considering what you have to do because – whether or not it's anonymized, it is a personal experiment. I don't know if it's insulting. Facebook already knows all this stuff about you already. Like, the risk is almost zero here. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but I guess it's better than them just stealing it. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, it, it just I just can't see them uh, stealing uh, it, it that easily. I mean, the... Uh, the, the funny thing is, is the five bucks. I mean, just, just to record the voice, uh, the... Uh, but I, I think it's going to be good because you know people have trouble with pronunciations. It's just you, you still worry about the privacy part of it. I, I, think. I mean, the principle here is right. You you need this kind of data to train the stuff to be better. Uh, and people have said you shouldn't be taking my voice recordings. You should be paying. And so when Facebook pays, people still find things to criticize about. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 
they're always going to criticize something about Facebook. I mean, saying, uh, hey, portal followed by a first name from a friends list is not very revealing, you know, and and you only have to do it 10 times. That's that's actually a pretty good hourly wage, relatively speaking. That's yeah, I think you. I think maybe the first name from the friends list is the only thing I kind of was like, uh, I mean, it. If you're just trying to figure out speech recognition, why would it have to be someone's first name? Because you need is, to vary you need to vary it up and you don't want to use last name because that is more identifying. Well, not a last name, but it could be lots of different words, right? Right. But first name is easy because like just look at your friend list and pick these words. I suppose. And that helps cover a bunch of different phonemes. Yeah. Uh, New Mexico Attorney General Hector Balderas filed a lawsuit alleging Chromebooks provided to schools in the New Mexico area for free to schools, as I said, collect personal information from children younger than 13 years old without parental consent. Uh, the complaint claims that Google collected geolocation information, website visits, internet history, search engine records, student contact lists, voice recordings, and used student emails for advertising purposes in violation of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act and potentially a violation of New Mexico's Unfair Practices Act. Google denies the claims, saying they are factually wrong, and told CNET, quote, G Suite for Education allows schools to control account access and requires that schools obtain parental consent when necessary. Uh, my guess is some of this is innocent. Some of this is Google's a cloud service. So you share your information with the cloud, which means with Google, in order to allow the cloud service to work. Teachers need to be able to access student information to make this all work. So some of this might just be overreacting. Uh, they are also claiming that advertising was sold. And advertising, Google says, is not sold on these G Suite accounts for education. So either New Mexico is wrong or Google was doing that, uh, which is absolutely a violation of not only the law, but what they've said they do. Yeah, it sounds like if Google was actually doing that and knew about it, they would have said, uh, you're right, oversight, we we have now reversed this action. Uh, the company saying, we don't do this, this is wrong, does lead me to believe that maybe someone in New Mexico is, is not understanding what's going on. But again, it wasn't just accusing them, in which the case you're right. They could say, oops, sorry, oversight. They filed a lawsuit. So that takes away the option to say, oops, sorry, oversight, because that could undermine your case. Right. Uh, but- it, it seems like this would be something that someone would have noticed earlier. I don't know. Uh, I'm curious what the facts are behind this. Dave, I, I, does this bug you? Yeah, it just, I mean, Chromebooks in general, you kind of question what the, what, what they are going to do because they have, it's wide open. And, and even when these kids put the information in there, there's no telling what Google's going to do to share with it. So, I, I, you know, it does, it does bug me a little bit on that. Well, this might bug you. Might not. The federal Supreme Court of Switzerland upheld a lower court ruling that likes and shares of content on Facebook can be considered illegal defamation. In the case, the defendant had liked and shared posts of fellow animal rights activist Erwin Kessler defaming him as anti-Semitic and a neo-Nazi. The court cited the potential for such content to spread rapidly on social media could make likes and share defamatory in nature, and Swiss law only requires that an act be communicated to a third party to meet the threshold of defamation. The decision said a major factor in a defamation case would be how visible a shared post was outside of an immediate friend network of the defamed individual. Yeah, so this is it's important to note what Sarah said about in Swiss law, you only need to communicate the act. Uh, you don't only need to communicate to a third party to meet defamation if it's defamatory. Obviously, it has to be defamatory. Right. But once it's determined to be defamatory, in the United States, we have different laws. A lot of times you have to show things like actual malice or you have to show knowledge that you knew it wasn't true. The, it, there's different standards. So we're talking about Swiss law. And what the court's saying, I think, is less controversial than the headline, uh, which is they're saying the act of liking and sharing isn't the thing that gets you in trouble. It's when you spread it widely, uh, when you are are actually making this, you know, go viral. If you're just sharing it with a few friends and family uh, and maybe you don't know, then I don't think the court is saying that's what happens. But once you've spread it widely, then you are now communicating it in there. If I'm reading this right, you are you are now intentionally communicating it. And under Swiss law, that's all that you need to prove. You don't need to prove the person knew it was bad, knew it was wrong or whatever. If it's defamatory and you're spreading it, then you're communicating it to third parties. It's interesting that, again, we're talking about Swiss law here, but that, you know, the law is basically saying 
if you weren't paying enough attention, I don't know, you liked something because it was from a friend and, you know, you, you, it wasn't that you thought someone was a neo-Nazi or anything like that. Swiss law is like, well, don't share things like that then. You're going to get in trouble too. It's not it's not a, a matter of uh, uh, sort of blindly uh, liking and sharing and passing along information, which is how lots of things on the internet work right now. And people can say, ah, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Or I don't believe with the, you know, what the person, the original, original poster was saying. It's so was like, you need to, or you should not uh, engage. At least if you are likely to share this outside of your immediate network. Right. Uh, so if you if you keep things private or you just don't have a lot of people following you, the average Swiss citizen, citizen might not have to worry about falling afoul of this accidentally. But with great power comes great responsibility. And so if you are someone that has the potential to make something go viral, then the Swiss court here is saying, then you need to consider that before you start spreading something. I mean, I mean, Dave, I, I feel like this is somewhat reasonable to say you are also responsible for the content you spread if you if you can spread it far and wide. Yeah, I felt that I felt that right exactly. I mean, I'm not a Swiss citizen, so obviously I I don't have to follow this law, but I mean, there's none of these types of topics I would never f like or follow in, in you know for, in my lifetime. It's just not stuff I I'm into. Uh, and, and I know there's people out there who like to have that stuff, but uh, again, I'm glad I don't live I don't live in uh, Swiss Switzerland. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, it's, a, it's a lovely country. It really is. It's lovely. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind visiting. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that if I lived in Switzerland, I'd worry about this uh, yeah. uh, too much. And I am somebody who has the ability, uh, you know, certainly on Twitter uh, to spread something far and wide. But I, I also know that even in the United States, I could be subject to defamatory, you know, considerations given that I, I do a podcast that is that is widely operated. So I'm comfortable with that. And I think we need more of these kinds of decisions that say, look, you you can't always blame the platform. There are things right. the platform yeah. should be doing well and be doing better. And there are things that individuals should take responsibility for. I think that's an important point. Earlier this week, Vice reported that India's BJP party, that's the uh, party of Narendra Modi, uh, the, the leader of the government right now, partnered with political communication firm The Ideas with a Z factory to create a translated version of a plea from the BJP party president, Manoj Tiwari, asking for people in Delhi to vote for his party. Uh, the original video was recorded by Tiwari sitting in a chair the Ideas Factory then trained a lip sync algorithm on speeches by Tiwari to learn his mouth shape. That's what deep fakes do. And a dubbing artist came in and recorded his speech in the Haryanvi language, something that Tiwari doesn't speak. That recording of the dub actor was put into the original Tawari video and the algorithm then modified Tawari's mouth to match the words of the person speaking Haryanvi. So it wasn't faking Tawari's voice, but it was faking his appearance to make it appear as if he were speaking in the Haryanvi language. The modified video was then posted across 5,800 WhatsApp groups to reach people in the Haryanvi speaking migrant worker population in Delhi and attempt to persuade them to vote for his party in the upcoming election. Now, this sets off a lot of people because it's using a deep fake in an election, but it's not the usual thing you assume, which is someone using it to attack someone and make them look bad. It's using them to make the leader of the party look like they speak the language of a group they want to vote for their party, even though he doesn't. So it is faking it. It's faking it for accessibility so that people can understand the message, but it's also implying that, hey, look, he speaks our language when, in fact, he doesn't. Yeah, I think that <laughs> I was trying to I was thinking to myself, OK, there are a lot more languages spoken in India than the U.S. where we live. But if this were a politician in the U.S., that didn't speak Spanish, let's say, and there was a really good deep fake and it was attempting to persuade a lot of Spanish speaking voters to vote for this politician, you know, it gets, the area gets a little gray, right? Yeah, there is an accessibility factor to this. And, and, and a person who doesn't speak English, let's say, if that was the first language that the politician spoke, 
uh, if they if they're now receiving a message that they're really on board with, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it also is, it's it's you're not lying, but it's almost as if, hey, I'm one of you, but but you're not, and you didn't have to learn a language, and you don't necessarily have a lot in common with the people that you're trying to get to vote for you. So. I'd be interested to see, you know, if, if anybody takes a lot of issue with this because it's clever, but it's messy. If it weren't political, I don't think people would have much problem with it, right? If yeah. it's if it's a CDC, you know, the equivalent of a of a disease exactly. control agency yeah. uh, putting stuff out there, and they're like, "Look, we 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 didn't have time to film 15 different people. We wanted it to all come from the mouth of the leader of our of our agency." Yeah. Uh, my, people might have less problem I, with it. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, you hit the right nail on the head there. This political, I mean, just anything that's political, it's it, you, it, it, it. Everybody makes a big, huge deal out of it. If it was, if it was nothing else, then then it, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. So, it yeah, that that's that's really why I, I see things. It's just right. it's political. I, I I would add the the one difference is that there are alternative methods for accessibility besides doing a deep fake to get your message across. You could use uh, captioning. You could use a, an overdub of someone else's voice. If the whole point is to convince people that this person is authentically a native mm -hmm. Havarti, H Harvan, yep, Harvani speaker, I think it's it's a little kind of a it's it's kind of like disingenuous. Yeah, yeah. Well, disingenuous. But also, is is the whole point to convince people that he is a native Haryanvi speaker? I imagine they would say no. That's not the whole point. The point is to have the words of our party leader delivered in their language. Right. And yes, you it, could have someone else read them, but then they're not coming from the party leader. And yes, you could put captions, but that's not quite as accessible if someone can't read as having it spoken. Or you could have uh, it spoken with someone else's voice over his voice. I mean, they do it all the time with translations. Right. And so if you're going to do that, why not make the mouth m match and just make it make it smoother? Does it matter at that point when really it's the message and not the connection of the lips? Right. And the, words? And, and, and the point is being that is that the message is not at issue here. We're not talking about there being any lies in the message. This is just a, hey, please vote for us message. Right. Uh, so I, I, I could see where the line gets real fuzzy there of like, well, wait, if I could just have somebody else speak it, why can't I have somebody else speak it and match it up to the video of the politician? Like, what what's so wrong with that? We're not saying he speaks Haryanbi. We're not trying, you know, it's it's interesting. There's, there's get, a lot well, of room for debate. It kind of goes back to Swiss law. If you're not paying enough attention, you might think he is. Right. And, it, it, that, and that's a fair point. It mm -hmm. could imply a lot of things. Google announced that starting on August 3rd, new Google Play apps that request background location will need to pass a review. Existing apps will need to pass the review starting November 3rd, and the policy will apply to Google's own apps as well. Google says the review will look at if the app's core functionality justifies the background location, data gathering, and developers can request feedback from Google starting in May about the background location review. This is the opposite of our other stories today, and that I don't think anyone could disagree that this is a good thing. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, do you want background location? Well, why? And then yeah. the developer's well, like, well, here's, here's, here's my really good reason. Google's like, okay. So or we're not only asking people in the app if they want it to be on, we're asking the app developer uh, to justify why they even want to ask for it to be on, and we're applying it to our own apps. Uh, not, not, not a lot of uh, room for criticism outside of worrying like, oh, well, maybe Google won't really uh, be hard on their own apps or something like that. But, you know. Who knows, right? At that point, you can just you just don't trust Google to begin with. So I, I think this is doing all the right things. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. One response to the growing trend against accepting cash is uh, to pass laws requiring you to accept cash. That, that's happening in a few cities in the United States. We've talked about it before on the show. Uh, as cashless becomes more popular, they're saying, look, we're not going to let retailers not accept cash because that cuts some people out of society who don't have access to cashless forms of payment. However, in Sweden, where the society is already mostly cashless, like 90 plus percent cashless, the Reichsbank Central Bank announced it is launching a year-long pilot of a digital currency called the e-krona. The Reichsbank says it wants to make a digital payment system that is accessible to everyone. So they're coming at it from the other end saying, well, if we're going to have cashless, let's make sure that everybody can access it somehow. Uh, now, this test is just a test. 
Rick's Bank, uh, Rick's Bank economist Gabriel Soderberg told Technology Review, quote, there is currently no decision on issuing an e-krona, how an e-krona might be designed or what technology might be used. This is the beginning, right? They're, this is how they figure out all that stuff is like, let's run a pilot. Let's try some things. Let's collect feedback. Uh, but I thought it was interesting as as a different approach to solving the accessibility problem versus just requiring the existing system to stay to say, well, let's see if we can actually make the new system work for everybody. Yeah, and it, and if it and if it does work, if the eCrona can 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 work in Sweden and it it is sort of a tested model, this can apply to lots of other economies where the cashless society is a real issue for people who who need to deal in cash. And it also keeps, you know, private payments from taking over the entire cashless system. If the if the government is issuing its own uh, digital money, uh, then there is, you know, the trust of the central bank here in this That's case right. mm -hmm. uh, behind that, rather than having a Libra association or something like that move in and take over what would otherwise be the normal central bank's uh, province. So there's that aspect of it as well. Dave, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's 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 welcome to see this. I mean, I'm 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 hoping this continues across the world. Cashless uh, payments is just here to stay. You know, I use yeah. Apple Pay all the time, and it's it's cashless. So you know, it's a uh, it's it's definitely something I'm that's looking forward to. As long as you could make it where everybody can use it, uh, and that's exactly. that's no easy thing. That's that's a tall yeah. order, but but it this is. is how you investigate if that's possible by doing these kinds of tests. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Uh, we talked earlier this week about Microsoft Office uh, bringing together all of their apps into a bundled app for iOS and Android. Uh, and, and there's a minimal version of it for Android tablet. There's one coming for iOS. We're seeing more and more tools pitched toward not only mobile, but tablet. Uh, and Dave, you, you, you do use a tablet as your daily driver. Am I right? I use... I I, uh, I can't I'll, I can't admit that but I mix with it. I try to use you, okay it. okay I try to use you're, it all on, time, you're on your way I, oh yeah I've been on my way for years to the presentation about it I mean I've been I've always been an advocate of, of wanting to use it when we say tablet I think we're talking about an iPad because it it that's why I wrote this in here I said how do you identify between a tablet and a tablet that's a laptop because you know I work with with people that have uh, tablet laptops and a lot of convertibles out there yeah they're then the pull away keyboards it's a full out tablet just like an ipad so that's why i said are we using that instead of uh instead of using ipad as opposed to a a, a, a lap the laptop tablet so let's so. take the ipad as our example tablet for the, yeah. for this case if somebody yeah. says look i just want to use the ipad well they're gonna have to get a keyboard right have to get a keyboard. Have to get. Well, they can get a mouse now. They've made that accessible. Um, and there's a touchpad uh, availability uh, for it as well. So, uh, yeah, you do need to get that if you want to be the most productive. Uh, you know, typing on the, uh, the the screen keyboard can be cumbersome, hard hard to maneuver after time. So you're definitely going to want a keyboard. But there's so many of them out there that even if you you know we saw Bridge at uh, at CES, they uh, they have they're coming out with their new one, the Pro Plus, with uh, the entire case and everything, and plus a touchpad built into it. So, uh, so th th that's really where I'm, I thought we're, we're really going to kicking in the high gear with a start to making an iPad you know a full da full time daily driver. I think a lot of people assume, well, if all you need to do is email and web surfing, then sure, I can use a tablet. Uh, right. But yeah, I, what about power users? What about enterprise users? Well, yeah, those power users, we get, uh, I mean, you, there's a ton of great software out there. You know, podcasters are using iPads as their daily driver for doing their podcasts, uh, video editing and photo editing, huge, huge things. And as well as productivity, you talked about Microsoft Office earlier this week. I've talked about it on my, on my podcast uh, just yesterday. So it's a, Microsoft Office is a really big driver of, of uh, iOS. I really like seeing it. And uh, and having as a standalone app with all, having the standalone apps, but now you have the, all-in-one app, which is is going to be great, and and it, the the cool thing too is it does work in enterprise. I did test it, so um, and and with when we if we drive over to enterprise a little bit, you know, you, you talk about systems that are designed more for mobility in mind. They they have to access systems, and that's where the challenge is in enterprise systems. Meaning there, there are specific applications that are that are not outside the, the in, on the other world, of the internet. I think the one thing that that trips me up in the idea of relying on the tablet, uh, well, two things. One is just just the 
processing power. Sometimes I, oh. I just need a bigger one. And and I don't think there's any way around it. That's that's just maybe over time going to go away. But that's that's the same as choosing between an ultralight and a more powerful yeah. laptop. So that's almost a false comparison. But mm -hmm. the other thing is the ability to do quick window switching. Uh, and I know that's getting better all the time. But even still, even with mouse support in iPad OS, uh, it oh. just doesn't feel as fast and fluid as the time-honored window interface that, that you get on, on a good old-fashioned laptop. No, I agree with you on that. Um, the mouse right now is, I don't even know if I can just say, say it's usable at this point. I mean, you got to <laughs> go deep into accessibility just to get to it, uh, to set it up. So, But the nice thing is, like I said, with these bridge keyboard with touchpads, I think it's going to be more fluid. Uh, I'm really interested if they haven't uh, uh, been really set out into the market yet but uh be interesting to see how how that touchpad will interface with it um and you know hardware in itself there's just so many choices uh, of adding to the ipad but uh, as far as going back to your point about the processing i think the processing ha actually has gotten a lot faster um and I, I find it almost equivalent to some laptops that i've i've tested um as far as that goes yeah, where where is the line? Because I know you can definitely do video editing, uh, oh, but you can't really do three D rendering. You can't you can't do some of the higher end stuff. You can't process. No. Uh, you, there, there's a limit to oh, what yeah. you can process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are going to be the extreme pro pro users, and uh, yeah, there's no way an iPad's going to do that for them. You know, good at video editing, even just using iMovie or any type of video editing that's out there. Uh, is going to be be uh, good. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more on, on enterprise, why uh, why iPads would be ideal is uh, you get, might get into situations where uh, high-risk locations have to be traveled to, like like China, Russia, uh, then you know, the iPads are the way to go because they, you know those two governments want to decrypt your device and you can't keep it with a password. So iPads, they don't have choice. Yeah, and I, honestly, I, that's another advantage to the Chromebook is because you have to yeah. log in with your account uh, you you can have separate accounts. You can log in with a with right. a not a dummy account per se, but a, sort of a travel account, if if you will. Uh, and that's that's a nice thing about the iPad OS as well, and and even Android. Uh, Android tablets can do the same thing. So that's a very good point. Well, thank you, uh, Dave, yeah. for for walking us through that. I'm, I'm curious what what people out there think, uh, yeah. especially if you are someone who uses a tablet more often. Uh, send us an email feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on other stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join in the conversation in our Discord. It's the best community around, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Well, Dwayne wanted to weigh in on our discussion yesterday about Apple's App Store policies and what is working and what needs to change. Dwayne says Apple's policy is an attempt to strengthen and maintain the iOS economy. If large developers were able to place their free apps in the App Store and permitted to be processed externally, then the large developers would be able to take advantage of the entire ecosystem without contributing anything to the iOS economy. Large developers would get for free App Store editorials, the developer tools, WWDC entry, all of the overhead of making and growing the platform. More egregiously, it would mean that small developers would be subsidizing the ecosystem for everyone. Apple's solution may not be the best, but I do think that putting up a roadblock for developers to prevent the willful bypass of contributing to the App Store ecosystem while providing the opportunity for small developers to put up free apps for distribution without cost puts Apple's policy in a more egalitarian term as opposed to a pure money grab. Dwayne and I had a, uh, a great email conversation about this because my, my response to him was, yes, and all of the big companies still take advantage of all of those attributes that you mentioned without paying. Amazon Prime Video, Audible, Comixology, they're all in there without paying. Fandango, in there without paying. Netflix now, in there without paying. So they're doing all the things that he says. Uh, and he had some good points about the fact that, yes, but... Uh, it does hold the line and it sets the precedent and and it makes some space uh, for for those small developers. Uh, but it was an inter interesting point to say, like, look, there is a there is a reason to hold that line. I think where Dwayne and I ended up in our, in our email conversation was, wouldn't it be nice if there was some compromise, if there was a way to say, look, we need you to contribute 
uh, to the upkeep of the app store, but also in a way that didn't hurt us as users and make us like, you know, just don't make it illegal to link to something is kind of where I, I sit on this anyway. Um, Dave, I'm curious where you sit on this idea of not allowing anyone to even link out to another way to pay for something. Yeah, I, Apple gets really weird with the payment stuff. I, I think uh, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. Um, again, like you said, putting something, putting uh, uh, what people want as far as their apps and what they do, they give Apple taking control of it is uh, definitely a big thing. But uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting. This is definitely going to be interesting to see where this goes. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including DeGracia A. Daniels, Ken Hayes, and Brad Schick. Len Peralta has been with us as he is most Fridays drawing during the show. What have you been inspired by this week? You know, in a couple weeks, I'm going to be putting this tablet versus laptop to the test oh, yeah. as I go out to Seattle to draw live in front of an audience. And I have to agree with most of what you're saying, you know, the computing power, things like that. Uh, but really what it comes down to is just creativity. What do you want? What do you feel comfortable with? And that's what this is sort of. It's sort of like, can't we all just get along here? Tablet versus laptop. Why do we have to put them you know, against each other? And Because I don't want to have to fight. carry both, Lynn. That's I know. Why. I know. But I... <laughs> But look at these guys. These, uh, I know. Look at their little <laughs> tablet and computer faces. See, we, we can coexist. Yes, they can all get just, just get along. And that's what this is all about. It's called Tablet versus Laptop. It's available right now at my Patreon if you're a Patreon subscriber. Uh, and it's also at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. And also, I want to mention, I will be at Convey UX in Seattle in a couple weeks putting this to the test. And we will see how I do. So uh, stay tuned. Sounds good, Len. Thank you so much. Also, thanks to G Dave Ginsburg for being on our show today. Happy Friday to you, Dave. It was so nice to have you. Let folks know uh, what you're up to and how they can keep up with your work. Yeah, uh, happy Friday to you as well. Thanks for having me. Uh, you can uh, find me on my website, uh, intouchwithios.com. That's my podcast. been doing that for about two but thumbs three years now, having a lot of fun doing that, talking about iOS. And then uh, if you want to reach out to me on Twitter, uh, I have Twitter handles, DaveG65. Folks, you can get a whole lot more out of Daily Tech News Show uh, for just two bucks a month. Uh, if you are listening to this on the public feed and you've heard some ads, uh, you can get an RSS feed out of Patreon that doesn't have the ads. It includes extra shows like our bonus show where we look back at old lineups or or live with it, uh, where Sarah and Roger talk about spending a lot of time with gear and giving in-depth uh, reviews of that time that they've spent. Uh, and the only way to get that stuff is to become a patron. So uh, stop down right now. And uh, if you've got two bucks that you can afford to spend this month, we'd love to have it. Patreon.com slash DTNS. We'd also love your emails. You have some feedback for us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>